I want to talk about something that became apparent to me in my own journey, and that is about how spiritual warfare is essential to our growth. And I also want to discuss how to truly battle against spiritual warfare in ways you may not expect that are much more effective. And so first of all, I want to talk about God's sovereignty, right? Christ is Lord over all, even if the ruler of this world is still operating. But no matter what you're going through, I want you to rest assured that our Lord is always with you. He loves you. And also, nothing that you're going through is something that he hasn't allowed, which can be very challenging for us when we are in extreme suffering, extreme trials, going through all sorts of horrible things in this fallen world. But what I came to understand on my path is that through these trials and tribulations, Christ is stripping us down and stripping us bare of our flesh. In fact, the invitation in all spiritual warfare is to take what is triggered within us, be it our fear or doubt or lack of trust and faith in the Lord, or suffering or pain or anxiety, whatever challenges arise within us from those triggers, wherever they come from, give us a sort of perfect map to that which we need to submit to Christ in order to be set more and more free by his mercy, goodness, and kindness. Because what spiritual warfare often does is trigger our fleshy selves. And I'm not saying that um, we aren't made perfect by the blood of Christ in terms of salvation. But for those of us who don't find salvation on our deathbeds, we then enter a lifelong process of being conformed to the image of Christ more and more and more as we go deeper in intimate relationship with him, which is the actual key. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit, remembering that it's the Lord who transforms us, and that he will mold and shape us through whatever life throws our way. And indeed, the thing we maybe actually need in that moment that we're dealing with the warfare and the challenge is to learn to turn towards him and behold more of his face, behold more of him as the verse spoke, and invite him in to help us in that process. Something I noticed after being called totally outside of the institutional church system and then called on a journey through it in a vision by our Lord was that most Christians are actually trying to fight spiritual battles and warfare on their own power. We may call on the name of Jesus, and don't get me wrong, he gives us all his power and authority in his name, but God doesn't call us to fight our battles on our own. In fact, that transformation from flesh by his spirit, as we behold more and more of our Lord in all his radiant, magnificent beauty and glory, is actually inviting us into a deeper journey with Christ where we learn to rely on ourselves less and less and less and rely on him more and more and more, eating from his tree of life versus trying to do it all on our own. And so I wanna talk about Ephesians chapter six from verse 10 to 20 because I think that a lot of us actually misinterpret what this means and we're trying to do battle in the spiritual realms by going through the checklist when what he's really calling us into is authentic surrender and relationship to him, where we call on him, where every prayer is asking him to fight our battles and we aren't just picking up tools like the Bible or his name and trying to wield them ourselves. So starting in verse 10, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So I feel the part that we overlook there is saying be strong in the Lord, not in our own strength. We are made strong by his spirit, by his strength dwelling within us. And his strength and the way that that expresses itself through us is often the opposite of worldly strength and battles like a military battle. It often requires total surrender and trust, which is why Paul writes next, 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Because we aren't fighting people, but principalities, and we cannot in our flesh fight those. And so we need a spiritual being, the God of heavenly hosts and armies, to fight those battles for us, friends, not ourselves. And it's actually a very passive process. Like when Moses was told to keep his hands raised, praying to the Lord over the battle, and the Lord delivered Israel. It had nothing to do with Moses' strength at all. In verse 13, he continues with, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And so we often take that passage and think we're supposed to pick up this thing or do that thing in order to be protected from spiritual warfare and do battle ourselves. But if you read this text carefully, what Paul is actually calling us to do is completely rely on the Lord for our victory and completely give the battle over to him as our king, as our warrior, as the God of all the heavenly hosts or armies, right? The armor of God includes standing firm and grounded in his truth of who he is and who you are, who we are in him. The breastplate of righteousness is his righteousness, which purifies our hearts by his spirit. Not us falling into legalistic tendencies to overcome sin by our own will. And the shoes are readiness given by the gospel of peace. What guides our feet is his peaceful presence, the peace he gives us which surpasses all understanding. A peace we cannot cultivate ourselves except through deep communion with him. And then there's the shield of faith that extinguishes the flaming darts of the evil one. And our faith in Christ is strengthened not by the things we do, but by just being with him. By spending time with him in this secret place, developing a real and true relationship. Not just going through our spiritual to-do lists and checklists of what makes us a good Christian, but by authentic relationship with Christ, letting our love for him overflow our hearts and receiving his love and his life-giving spirit, which strengthens our faith. As from that place of joy and love, we become invincible and bulletproof in Christ. No matter what warfare we're going through, no matter what's happening in our bodies or the outside world, and that peace comes, as in the previous verse, from allowing him to purify and cleanse our hearts, from taking all the triggers that come up within us when we are undergoing spiritual warfare to the cross, not to pick up our crosses and follow him, but to take our sin, our flesh, to his cross and sacrifice it on the altar, asking him to transform us not by our own willpower, which is going to lead to burnout and wear us down and make us more vulnerable to the enemy's attacks, which God will allow until we fully surrender to him. As Paul wrote to the Philippians, starting in chapter four, verse five, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. A lot of the times in our verse memorization, we skip that ending part of verse 5 that says, The Lord is at hand, meaning that the Lord is there ready and willing to give us a hand whenever we, in prayer and supplication, humble ourselves and ask him to. Not just using his name to wield it against demons and trampling serpents, but rejoicing that our names are written in heaven, as Luke chapter 10, verse 19 and 20 revealed. And that the peace of God that comes from him alone, that comes from his spirit dwelling within us, as we make more and more room for him by surrendering our brokenness and flesh to the cross, 
is the shield that actually guards our hearts and minds from the world, regardless of what is happening in the world within us or even in our bodies. Because the true path of being a disciple, a follower of Christ, not just a passive believer, means, like Jesus said, that in this life we're going to face all sorts of trials and tribulations. But we can take heart because he has overcome the world. It's not a guarantee or a promise that we'll never suffer again until we leave our earthly bodies and receive our new resurrected ones. In fact, oftentimes we end up going through a lot more suffering and the cost is very high. Yet those of us who are on this path, who know the Lord, who have beheld him, who have caught a glimpse of his beauty and magnificence and glory in whatever way he's personally revealed that to our hearts, know that there is no other path. And so if you're struggling with any of this, feel free to check out my free ebook linked below if you join and subscribe to my weekly witness email list where I share deeper, more personal weekly insights that are not on this YouTube channel. It's called Three Simple Steps to Resting in God's Love and I pray that it can be a tremendous help to you in your journey as it was in mine when I was spinning out and anxious which was a very necessary and important part of the process that the Lord taught me to harness and give to him that he may do his work in me and provide me with this deep abiding peace that hasn't left me in many months, regardless of trial, tribulation, and suffering. Because that is the Lord's promise that he went away to give us the advocate so that no matter what we're dealing with in this life, he will always be with us, bringing us peace and comfort. And that process of transformation is about one thing, helping us to learn to truly depend on the Lord for everything. Because from that place, when he truly strips us bare, we can really step into the anointing and the calling that God has for each of us. Once we have built our firm foundation and become grounded in him and he has built his structure into us so that we may truly receive his fullness because when we don't the power of the Holy Spirit can end up burning us and we can drown in our anointings and we simply aren't ready for all the blessings that he has planned for us because they need a firm place to land so wherever you're at with all that friends I'm sending you so much love God bless you and keep you and may you learn to turn to him in your hour of trial to build more trust and safety and intimacy with him, which is the path to the life he has planned for you, to prosper you and not to harm you. In Jesus' name, friends, I pray these things over you. Amen.